open with me to Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4 is where we're going to be this morning. It'll be on the screen as well, but I'd love, if you have a paper Bible, and if you don't have a paper Bible, we would love to get a paper Bible in your hands. Phone is a great tool and resource for on the go, but there is nothing that compares with a tangible Bible. So if you need one, talk to us. We would love to get one in your hands. Let's read Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things on this earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that we can gather in a place today where we get to look at the word of God together and press in and see what you have to say to us. So God, we pray that you speak. Spirit, would you move in our hearts and in our minds? God, this is about you and for your glory. It's your words, so elevate them. Amen. So last week, we've been going through a series of Colossians. Last week, Chase talked about the end of chapter two um, on the sufficiency of Christ. This week, there's this big shift that's happening right here. So the first two chapters of Colossians, the way that Paul writes his letters is the first two chapters are doctrine. So it's everything he's teaching us. He wants us to know who is God, all of these truths. And then the second half of his letters, and all the letters that he wrote is he's wrote multiple letters in this, the Bible. The second half is all about the practical. So it's who is God, all the theological truths, and then how do we live it out? So we're taking this turn right here, this pivotal turn, where we're going away from that and then diving into what does it really look like for us as we're, if we've understood these things, what's it really mean for us to live it out? But I'm going to go into a little bit more theological truth today because we need these foundations because they're so clear of what Paul is writing right here. What these verses are communicating is powerful for you and for me. We're walking into a new mindset is what's going to happen today. We're going to watch the way that Paul speaks truth to us, elevates our eyes, and then how we walk through that. So here we go, four foundational truths that we are glaring at us right as we read these four verses. The first one is that God is real. Really simple, really powerful. We read the word God twice, I'm in the ESV. So we see the word God come in twice, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You see, without the reality and the truth of God being real, these verses are just a bunch of make-believe. It's false. It really doesn't mean anything significant for us. In Paul's day, we think about, right, the Bible times, like, oh, it's probably just fine. Like, they didn't have many issues. But this whole letter is because of this false prophet, because of the false teaching that was happening in this church. And so Paul is redirecting. So we've got to know that in Paul's day and in our day, it looks different. But there's a bunch of religious confusion and different viewpoints happening. There's not just this world that we live in where it's atheists, those who don't believe in God, and theists, those who believe in God. Like, it's, it gets messy and squirrely in there. And we see that in our culture that we live in today, there's churches and pastors that you could walk into and they really only believe in the idea of God. They don't believe that God is really real. They're not preaching the truth of the Bible and the fullness of who God is. And so we have confusion. And these pastors that just think the idea of God is good are gonna preach a message that says, man, God is enough We'll preach God to the extent and share him to the extent that it makes you um, conform to a really kind and good person. Because that's what we really want more in this world. We just want kind and good people that kind of make the world easier to go by and life easier to get through. But that's not the reality of who God is. When we look at verses one and three, 
as it refers to God, it's not this idea, it's the truth. Like God is God. He fully exists. When we look at Colossians 1, it talks about how God created everything. He created our minds. He created the minds of us who believe in him. He created the minds of us who don't believe in him. And he sees it all and it's good because he created it and he's good. Now, when we look at this and recognize that God is real and we look at the Bible, if you don't believe it, then this really doesn't matter much to you. And that's okay, because look at this. At one point in our life, if you choose to believe that God is real, you went from a place of not believing that God is real to believing that God is real. And so if you are in here and you find yourself in a place of going like, man, I don't know if God is real. I don't know if I fully believe that. That's okay. Because it's a journey of understanding who God is, who he says he is, and trusting that. And so as you listen to this today, there's so much grace in that. Second theological truth that we see, this foundational truth, is that Christ is seated at the right hand of God. The right hand is a place of power. It's a place of authority. And so God sets Christ at the right hand his right hand. It's the place of highest honor and dignity and power. He's not above God. He's not below God, but he is acting as God and God acting through him. In uh, the book of 1 Peter, Peter writes how this place of power at the right hand is like this. He's at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. All of the powers of the universe are under Christ. Everything that we see on this earth, it is subjected under Christ because he's got the ultimate authority and power. Then Paul, in a different letter in Romans, he writes that this this right-hand position of Christ allows Christ to intercede for us on our behalf. So as we pray and make petition, as we engage with God, Christ can intercede for us. He's that bridge. Here's what it says, Romans 8, 34. He is at the right hand of God who is interceding for us. And so we've got to understand and believe that truth to believe this chunk of passage and the realness and the way it changes us. Third thing, You have died and your life is hidden with Christ. Kind of be confusing as we read that for the first time. But you've died. If you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have died. The worst is behind you. That fear of death is gone. Your life is hidden with Christ, which means that it is fully secure. It's as secure as the relationship with God and this God the Father and God the Son, right? It's this intimate relationship that can't be broken or taken away from you. And so you get to trust, and it's active trust, you get to trust that there is security in that. Now, here's the thing. The world can't fully see it yet, and that's why it's hidden. This word hidden, we see. We are hidden with Christ. Our culture around us, those who don't uh, have the same mindset as as a Christ follower cannot fully see the fullness of what this looks like. Now, it also is referencing as a believer, if you have been baptized, that you have that same security Colossians 2, 12 talks about. It says, you've been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Baptism signifies as we go underwater and come up again, it signifies that we have died with Christ and that we have life in him. We were buried and raised with Christ and now we are secure and our life is hidden in Christ. And this fourth foundational truth right here we see is that Christ, verse four, Christ will appear and you will also appear with him in glory. Colossians is all about Christ. Like the glory that Christ gets as he's on display is the most magnificent in this letter than any other book in the Bible. 
And as believers, we know, we head know that Christ is our life. Sometimes it's uh, something that we forget as we walk out our days. But as we talk about, or as we look at the way that Christ will appear because Christ is coming back. He died on the cross, was buried, rose again, rose back into heaven and is there with all power and all authority at the right hand of God. And one day the Bible promises us that he will return and come back on this earth. And we at that point will appear with him in glory. It is where that eternal is never, eternal is never gonna end, but where we get to see the way that God's kingdom is gonna go on and on and on. And it's gonna reign and rule over everything on this earth. He's coming back and he's gonna appear. Now I mentioned this, but there is no way for us to understand or comprehend the truth of this book without fully believing in God, without believing in the work that Jesus did for us. Because there's people that can say, that don't believe and they're like, yeah, I've read the Bible. It's a bunch of great stuff or a bunch of weird rules and things, but it can't transform or change us until we've believed and accepted because then we have the Holy Spirit, which opens our eyes to see this book differently than, if, than before. You might know that, you might have experienced that. You might have read these words and gone like, God, oh, those are some nice words, it's great. And then you accepted Jesus and then you recognize that there's power and authority and it transforms and changes you. And so that is where we're looking through. So now that we have this foundation of truth, now we're gonna walk through it in a little different uh, way. So here we go. It says, verse one, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above not the things that are on this earth, it says in verse two, they're in direct contrast with each other. You can't seek the things that are above and the things that are on earth. It's two different things. It involves living a life with him and for him and seeking the things of God above all else. Now seeking and setting are action words. They're not this like passive, okay, I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna kind of seek and I'm gonna kind of set and I'm gonna hope that I attain what I want to or have a relationship with God. No, it's a active action words. We can't be passive in seeking and setting. If I uh, need to pick my baby up, I can't be like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna set her over there. No, I have to literally grab her, move her away put her over here away from the fireplace or something, right? It's an, act, it's an action word. It's not something that I can just passively look at and go, yeah, I need to set her somewhere else because that's not safe. I hope that that changes. But if I don't do anything about it, that is not gonna change and happen. So seeking first, or setting our minds and seeking includes seeking first the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, 33 clearly points this out for us. Seek first the kingdom of heaven instead of seeking all the other things on this earth that we get weighed down by. You can probably really easily think about all the other, earth, all the other things on this earth that weigh you down instead of seeking first the kingdom of heaven. It's where we have to put, seek first the kingdom of heaven and seek all these things, where we put our treasure in the kingdom of heaven, where our hearts are, where we invest in all of these things, they've got to go that direction because if we are actively seeking the things that are on this earth, we're going to get the things that are on this earth. We're only going to gain what we seek. You know that? You only get what you seek, what you run after, what you put your heart and your mind and your body into. That's what we get. If I'm passive, I'm not gonna have a mindset that Paul describes right here. I'm not gonna have this mindset that can be renewed and transformed and changed where I'm actually seeking the things that are above me. A couple weeks ago, I finished a great book called um, Undistracted by Bob Goff. He's written Love Does, just great encouragement. Um, actually, we've got a bookshelf as you walk out and I wasn't gonna say this. We've got a great resource wall as you walk out of here for parents 
And there is a great devotional on there that he wrote for kids that we love reading to our boys. Um, we haven't read to the girls yet, but we love reading to the boys. But so he wrote this book and it challenged me in multiple different areas. But one of the things that he wrote, and I could find the stat anywhere, but it just really has stuck out and impacted me. He was saying how we make roughly 35,000 decisions in a day. Like micro decisions, right? Like I need to move my hand to, right? Like all these different things that our brain does in order to process, in order to move. And we get hung up on a lot, these big decisions in life. Like where am I gonna move? Where am I gonna work next? How am I gonna do this? And that seems to be what is that things that are on earth that is right in front of that view. But there's 35, let's say there's 20,000 decisions we make a day, if it's a real slow day. 10,000, whatever it is. But what if, what if we made choices where we are actively seeking God and setting our minds on him or 5,000 of those choices and decisions go through the lens and perspective of him? Can you imagine how that would change your day? When I set and seek in my home, our home feels it. When I don't set and seek, our home feels it. Um, it's powerful. It's powerful. One of the greatest areas that in our culture that we live in for the past 10, 12, 15 years that has really impacted our ability to set and seek and really keep our minds on this earth is social media. And if you're in social media, engage in social media, you know what I mean. There's the world of Facebook, and then there's the world of Instagram, and then there's Twitter and TikTok and Pinterest, right? Like there's, there's probably more, there's a lot, a lot of different things available, but there's different worlds that all of those touch. And if you are engaged in them, you know the impact, or maybe you aren't fully aware of the impact that they can have on you in the way that you seek the things and set your minds on the things that are on this earth. After I stare into a screen too long, sometimes I feel like I need to like, take a deep breath, maybe take a shower, because I feel like I'm, I'm entering the world that is actually in front of me instead of the world that I've spent 10 minutes or 45 minutes somehow sucked into on my phone where it was mindless. So I deleted them. I've gone through seasons of deleting things on my apps on my phone. I typically leave Facebook because I really don't sit and scroll Facebook as much. That's what I told myself. But then I realized when I delete Instagram, I wanna know what everyone's doing. And so, or I have to go check something. And then it just becomes a distraction. And then my mind is, my heart is broken and my mind is overwhelmed with the grief or the joy or the comparison that is on my phone in front of me. When we have something accessible at the tip of our fingertips, we've got this dull moment. Even in the midst of a conversation, a lull happens and we wanna quickly open something because we need to fill it. And we're looking for something and we go to that app because we're looking for a dopamine hit. We're looking for something that our brain just lights up and is like, oh, yes, I got what I was looking for. Okay, great, but now I want more. See, God created us to desire pleasure. That's how he created us. And there's this whole world of dopamine and I've spent years uh, in health coaching and I love the world of nutrition and food and how it impacts our bodies, but I have had so many conversations with people throughout the years about how when we eat a certain food item, it lights up certain signals and receptors in our brain. It's the same with social media, right? There's this like excitement that happens in our brain and we want it. We want to go back for more. And so we take a step back and we're like, okay, I'm off. And then we're lull and we're bored and we're like hungry for more. There's this world of addiction. Social media, food, they're minor addictions, but addiction, right? That whole encompassing realm. We're created for wanting pleasure and wanting joy and wanting these experiences that are so rich and so deep and so meaningful. 
And you know where we get that? Christ. He's our ultimate fulfillment of that. John Piper, a pastor that I've just respected and looked up to for years, great theologian said this, God is the supreme source of satisfaction for the human soul. There's a lot of things on earth that don't satisfy me. But God is my supreme source of satisfaction. He matches this deep desire for more, more pleasure, more joy, more fulfillment. We've got this responsibility when it comes to social media or when it comes to other things to look at and go, and what am I trying to fill this void with, with that's other than Christ? Because if the scripture tells me to set my mind on things above, to seek the things above, and I'm really seeking the things that are on earth for where I'm looking for pleasure and where I'm looking for joy, then I'm missing something and I'm always gonna be unfulfilled and wanting more. But as I keep pursuing Christ, he's gonna fill that void and he's gonna create in me a fulfillment that's so good and so rich. And as I go to him, I recognize he can fulfill that. And then I wanna go back to him. And as I do that more and more and more, I have more of that mindset. I've got more of that draw towards him. And the things of earth become not as alluring. I'm in a season where it's really easy for me to keep my eyes on what's in front of me. I've got four little kids. We threw a puppy in a month ago. We can talk about that another time. I, have, I love him. So the demands of this earth and the things in front of me are, like, the demands are constant, physically. Um, and I am a high doer. I want to do all day long. The amount of times we have a conversation in our marriage of, like, Chase is like, I just want you to sit for five minutes. I'm like, but there's 50 things I could do in five minutes that don't matter, but that are the most important thing in the world right now. Right? So I'm a high doer. And I want to focus on what's directly in front of me. And um, it's past 11 months since having joy. And I've recognized it with other kids. And it's looked different with other kids. Uh, I have really recognized how much I've dealt with postpartum anxiety. And it comes and goes in days and waves. And the season and where I'm at right now is different than where I was a few months ago. But for me was I set my eyes on the things right in front of me because that's how I operate. It's overwhelming. And so anxiety filled and like paralyzing in moments. Thinking about doing the laundry is paralyzing. And then I pause and recognize that when I set and seek my eyes on Christ, everything changes. But remember how I said that um, God, as he's real, under that section, God created our minds. He created everything. And so he knows everything. So for those of you that are walking through any journey on the mental health battle, it's a large spectrum. But here's the truth that as I look into the scripture, that I see Christ is our greatest hope. He's not the only answer and the only solution. And I think medicine is a beautiful gift. And there's a lot of great resources. But Christ is our greatest hope in that. And he's my greatest hope when I feel like I just can't. If I keep living and looking at what's right in front of me, I can't. It's way too much. But as I look at God... It, everything changes. It's still a lot that's in front of me. It's still a lot in front of you. It's still extremely uh, real what you are walking through. And yet Christ gives us a glimmer of hope. Here's what I know. There are some of you in debt so deep that paying for groceries seems a little bit too much right now or that the grief that you are walking through is unbearable. Or you or your loved one got a, uh, a health diagnosis that's life altering. 
or there's injustice happening against you or your kids. There's something so big and glaring right in front of you that the things that are on this earth are so clear and in your face. And so how do we do this? How do we actually set, seek the things that are above and set our minds on the things that are above, not on this earth? Because we live on earth. We don't live in heaven. That's not our, we're still here. If our heart is beating, we're still here. And so we get to live in this tension-filled place where we're on earth, where we have to actively set and seek. In the midst of every demand and disappointment and every despair, Christ is right there. If we look up and look at him, we can take a deep breath. I have to take a lot of deep breaths and raise our eyes towards Christ. Paul is giving us this clarity on how we do it. It's so clear, he says, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, right? He's got all that power and authority available for us and for you in every situation, in every circumstance. He's there and he wants to be there for you. And he's interceding on your behalf for the Father. Setting and seeking aren't our natural uh, operating systems. It's not something you can merely pray about and go, God, would you just help me seek and set today for the rest of my life and then it magically happens, right? It's that active action where nobody else can do it for us. I want somebody else to do it for me sometimes, honestly. If I'm real, like my, where our mind goes, what our natural tendency is, is the flesh. The flesh is always gonna win if we are not actively seeking and setting. until we reprogram our mindset. And this is how we do it. Romans 12, two says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. He's gonna renew our minds as we set and seek. So how do we do it? Two real practicals, pause and be with the Lord. If you've walked through emotionally healthy spirituality, it transformed my life in fall. If you have not walked through emotionally healthy spirituality, you'll hear about it at other points, but it's an eight week course. It's not just another thing the church puts on. Here's what happened for me. I learned how to sit in the presence of God and just be present with him. Not easy, my flesh wanted to win most of the time. But as I sat and went, okay, God, you've got two minutes where I'm setting a timer You've got two minutes where I'm gonna set aside the things that are on this earth and I'm gonna set my mind on you, right? That dopamine hit of like, oh, being in the presence of God. Oh, this is better. This is better than everything else. This is washing away all the other stuff. And so I can walk out of those two minutes and then it can be 20 minutes, however many minutes, but it's that like intentional, how do I do it? You've got to pause and be with the Lord. You can't do it just by running in action. You have to be with the Lord. And that's where a new mindset comes in. The second way we do it is by replacing our source. My phone is a great source of information. Man, I can treat my kids because of all the functional or holistic medical doctors that I follow with anything that happens. if I'm looking at that all the time, then man, I'm looking at the things on this earth. And what I need is God to be my source. God's word has to dictate, instead of these other really great people that are out and around me or through social media or on the news, like God's word has to dictate what we're setting our mind on. Because if I'm setting my mind on something else, even that a good pastor told me to set my mind on, I could be off because this is our source of what we have to set our mind on. I've got to set my mind on the truth of God. I mean, I was in counseling this week and I've got an incredible spirit-led counselor. She's amazing. 
and she's what I need in the season. And what she was walking through with me were four v verses that she's like, Holly, you need to get these in your mind so that in your operating system, as this happens, you've got these four verses that you begin repeating over and over. So write them up, put them on your bulletin board in multiple spots and let the word of God dictate your thought life. Let the word of God dictate what you're gonna think about and how you're gonna respond and how you're gonna react because this is our source. Pausing and being with the Lord and replacing our source of all the other content and things that are on this earth with this, that's how we set and seek. It's powerful, it's transformative. When we realize that God is real and that Christ is at the right hand of God and you've died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God secure. And we're gonna appear with him in glory in the future when he comes back fully reigning. Like these are the realities that as we seek them, our perspective changes, our mindset changes. I wanna pray for you this morning. Would you close your eyes with me? Bow your heads. God, I'm so thankful for your word. God, I'm so thankful for the way that as we follow and believe in Christ, you can open our eyes to see things in this word that are real and powerful and life altering. God, I pray for my friends, God, that know you, God, my friends that don't know you, God, would you change our hearts and our minds through the truth of your word, through the truth of what Paul wrote to a group of people that needed it. God, we need it. God, we need help by your spirit in setting our minds on you. God, would you reveal to each of us, because you can, how we need to actively seek you, how we need to actively set our mind on you. God, would you show us a moment in our day, even if it's what we don't want to be doing, would you show us a moment or moments in our day where we can pause and push away the things of this earth and set our minds just directly on you? God, would you give us people around us that push us to be in your word, that push us, push back in conversation, say, man, those are great things and opinions you're thinking about, but have you gone to the word of the Lord lately? God, we need you to be our source. We need you to be what dictates all that we do. Jesus, you have our minds, you have our hearts, you have our attention. And we want more and more and more of you. Thank you that your word is real and powerful and transformative. Christ, we submit ourselves to you today and we look at you in all of your glory. In your holy name we pray, amen.